Thank you, Senator Daines. I just have a, a couple more quick things, and then we'll be able to wrap here. Um, there was a recent case involving a tribal clinic uh, in Alaska. This was Manilik versus Burwell, and it, it's established that Section 105L of the Indian Self-Determination Act mandates that payment of leasing costs when tribal facilities are used to operate IHS programs. But the budget proposal would override this section um, with a notwithstanding clause that would make such lease payments entirely discretionary within the agency. And given that this language would affect one of the most important statutes governing Indian country, the question to you this morning is whether or not this proposal has been shared with the chairman and the vice chairman of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, uh, both of whom are on this subcommittee. Of course, Senator Udall is the, is the vice chair, and Senator Hoven is the chair. So has this been shared uh, with the authorizing committee, and what is their view on this issue? And I'm not uh, quite up on the specifics of, of this particular case, and we'll ask Ms. Fowler to respond on our behalf. Okay. Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, this is the uh, group of leases that I mentioned in my response about the Village Built Clinics. Mm -hmm. This has been an emerging, as I said, it's an emerging um, issue. It's not been shared with the authorizers yet, as we are still evaluating the impact and the full uh, um, uh, scope of uh, funding needs that would be associated. Well, in, instead of, sep let's separate it from the funding needs, but do you think that it's reasonable that, that Indian tribes and, and tribal organizations should essentially be required to, to donate the use of their space to operate health care programs that are a federal responsibility according to this federal court decision? We do support the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act fully, but the issue at this point is the funding that's needed to well, implement it. Well, yes, let's go back a little bit because we, we spent years arguing over contract support costs. And what would happen is contract support costs would be short-changed, short-funded, and years of litigation, lots of money spent um, on good lawyers to argue that case, Supreme Court comes back and says, yes, in fact, you do have to pay full funding for contract support costs. And even with that directive, the budgets would come back at less than full funding. So we're finally, I think, beyond that, where we've had several years now of, of full funding. Um, again, I mentioned that we've got the language uh, out there that, that says you can't rob Peter to pay Paul in the various accounts. So we've made headway there. I would like to think that we're not going to be going down a, another path with the same situation where we acknowledge that there is a federal responsibility, there is a federal court decision that says you need to do this, and we say, well, we can't do it um, because we're, we're, we're moving dollars in, in other areas. So my hope is that we're not going to continue to spend a lot of money with, with lawyers and courts, um, but that we will recognize that there is, there is a responsibility here uh, on the federal side. Um, I, I, uh, I'm looking through the rest of my questions here, and, and again, I, I come back to the concerns that so many of us have raised on the panel here this morning, that with this budget, um, whether it's the facilities and maintenance backlog that we're dealing with um, and, and the real pressing need, whether it's the opioid crisis that is hitting our Native people at, at, at astonishing um, Rates, you know, we see it all over the country, but uh, we're, we're looking at a at a uh, a cut, a six percent cut, almost thirteen million dollars in the budget for alcohol and substance abuse programs, um, uh, with it within the domestic violence uh, initiatives. Yeah. Again, I I think about the headway that we have been making that we must continue to make, and and I find difficulty with this budget in terms of how we can. Um, can advance that. So know that you have a lot of passion, a lot of energy, a lot of purpose with this committee to help you with delivery of, of the um, 
uh, of the services and, and the support for our, our Native people. Um, I, I look with great pride at, at what Alaska has done. Um, you mentioned the NUCA model. Uh, I think it is innovative and pioneering in, in a way that the rest of the country should look. If we want to reform our health care delivery, reduce costs, increase satisfaction amongst patients and providers, look no further than the NUCA model. Unfortunately, we're not looking to the NUCA model. Other nations are looking at it, but within our own, uh, our own IH system, we've allowed for that flexibility to do some astonishing and great things. With the joint venture program, we have some facilities that are the model and the envy of, 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 of providers um, and, 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 and folks around, around the country. You go to Nome, you go to Bethel, you, we're, we've got an opportunity, we have an opportunity coming on in Bethel, um, but in other areas, we have, we have seen some great things. But I feel like within IHS, there's two worlds going on here because well, I have not had an opportunity to go out to Rosebud or to Pine Ridge. It breaks my heart to think that we have such disparities with how we are providing for health care for our Native peoples. And so if it's, if it's greater flexibility that, that we need, if we need to completely restructure the system, um, but I was, I was speaking with my ranking member here. We've been on the committee here for a while. We've both been on Indian Affairs, I think, since both of us came to the Senate. Year after year after year, it's the same, same sad story. And the frustration that Senator Tester has clearly um, uh, portrayed here today, followed up by Senator Daines, um, we're not getting mad at, at you as an individual. There is anger, there's frustration, um, and rightly so, because as, as, a, as a government, as an agency, we are failing these people. And there's a lot of focus right now on health care around the country and what we do to make it right. But in the meantime, you have, a, a, you have an injustice going on that is tucked away. Look at how many people are in this hearing room. Ten. Who's paying attention to, to the failures? Not enough. And apparently that's why it's allowed to continue. But we can't. And we won't. And I, yeah. we've got to get the attention of some folks within the administration. Maybe we need to get the president out to, to Rosebud or Pine Ridge. Maybe that'll make a difference. But we, we cannot allow this to continue. And there's a lot of goodwill, and I want to make sure that the people who have that goodwill are reinforced, are given the support that they need, and, and, the, and the belief in knowing that every day they're trying to do the right thing. So work with us on this. We've got a lot, a lot to do.